Hello, everybody. See some folks still connecting to audio. Lots of people connected now. Great. We've got a big group here today. Wonderful. Welcome to our senior social event for December, our virtual gathering here. Um, I see many familiar faces and some new ones as well. So we're really glad you're here, whether you're brand new to senior social at the AGO or uh, whether you're a regular, we're really happy to have you here today. My name is Lauren Spring and I'm an art educator with the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I'm here with my colleague. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lauren Ranzetti, the other Lauren of our tag team. Mm -hmm. And I also work at the AGO. Wonderful. And so the way that this works is we have an hour together and we're going to start by looking at two works of art, um, two that I really like. So we're going to start with a, a piece by Norval Morisot, and then we're also going to look at one by Cornelius Kraybaugh. And you'll notice that the theme of today is sort of wintry, kind of, you know, yeah, seasonal, somewhat festive, um, because we are in the middle of winter, holiday season for many. And I'm curious to know if you could just type into the chat where folks are uh, from. Where are you? Where are you joining us from today? Many from Ontario. Maybe some live down near the AGO. Others might be much farther away. We've had some participants from abroad before too. Wow. You've got okay, Mississauga, Toronto, Brampton. Great. Oh, your folks are scattered all around Toronto. Uh, Vancouver. Oh, hello there, Carla, all the way from Vancouver. I say good, good morning to you. It's even earlier where you are. Then we've got North York and Oakville. Great. So a lot of GTA, Paris, Ontario. Wonderful. Alaska. Did you see Alaska? that? I missed Alaska. That one. Welcome. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. Barbara, all the way from Alaska. How did you miss that? Oh, that's super. Thank you for being here. So exciting. Um, well, well, last time I was in person, so this time I have to be in Zoom. <laughs> oh, that's great. Oh, I recognize you. Yeah, from the printmaking. Well, I remember now. You've had a big. You've had a big couple of weeks in between. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, my next question was going to be. Um, whether we have winter lovers in the group. And maybe I know Barbara, has, <laughs> maybe Barbara is. She likes <laughs> snowy tundra. I could make that assumption perhaps. <laughs> um, yes, I am curious. Ah, oui, on a fleur ange la morte. Oui, j'aime l'hiver. Moi aussi, fleur ange. What a beautiful name. Um, yeah, so, so a few winter lovers. Any, anyone else kind of really embracing? Is this your, your best season? Given that we don't have anyone joining here uh, who's announced themselves from, you know, Florida or Mexico or <laughs> Colombia, so I'm assuming it's kind of wintry where where all of our participants are. Um, yeah, certainly an interesting time of year. We're heading into kind of the darkest week of the year. Um, I've I'm deliberately trying to embrace it this year and just uh, yeah, hibernate a little, try to you know, find things that are comfortable inside and uh, brace the cold when my daughter really wants to play in the snow. So yeah, we've got a few other winter lovers in the group. Great. So we are um, going to be looking at two sort of wintry themed pictures today. And then uh, we're going to be making some of our own art. And Lauren thought it would be a great idea to create some original greeting cards. And so we can do this with whatever materials you have available. Um, we're going to suggest sort of collage um, collage style. So if that's something you're able to do, wonderful. If not, you can work with whatever you have available. And specifically our first work, our one by Norval Morisot is going to be our main aesthetic inspiration. And then Kriegoff, uh, a kind of seasonal inspiration too. So uh, without further ado, we'll just dive right in. So here's a picture of the Art Gallery of Ontario located in downtown Toronto. Many of you are locals and Clearly, even those in Alaska have already been there. Um, so yeah, pretty extraordinary building. We house more than 90,000 works of art. So there's always something new on display. Anytime you come to visit, we're, we're rotating them uh, from the vaults into the collection. And I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the land the AGO is on is Mishi Sagig Nishnabe Territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. 
Toronto is Mishisagig Anishinaabe territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Confederacies. So let's start with this piece. Um, it's by Norval Morisot and called Moose Dream Legend. And before I share with you some of the things that I really appreciate about this piece, and we can chat a little bit more about Norval Morisot's approach to art making and his life, I just want to hear from you what you notice going on in this image. And you can, again, I should remind folks that you're able to type into the chat, or you can also unmute yourself and just share, share your thoughts that way too. So what do you notice going on here? I see repetition. Mm. Uh, and then bones and tracks and trees, snowshoes, um, and different aged uh, moose. A different agents. Ah, very nice. Yeah, so we have some kind of, those are great themes already. Thank you, Florence. So repetition. Obviously, we've got kind of these footprints here, this sweet little pattern, um, the inside, what we could, you know, some folks have called this sort of x-ray approach that um, is characteristic of a lot of Norval Morisot, and then even beyond him, what's called the Woodland School of Art. A lot of folks emulate this style. So repetition and yeah, these the different ages of moose here. Um, quite neat to see. So we might wonder, okay, maybe you know, maybe this is sort of moose traveling together, or is this a little bit bigger and less literal, and maybe you know, a moose throughout its lifespan, or or some other kind of longer term narrative that's that's occurring here. We've got quite a lot in the chat here. Let's see. Um, yeah, so we've got so a lot of movement in one direction. Yeah, that's really neat, right? And and I love, I absolutely love in the winter when there's a fresh kind of snowfall. And then my daughter and I go out and we try to guess what animals have left these tracks. And we live in Guelph, and so there's lots of different animals around here. Um, so uh, movement certainly, and I mean it's it's awfully fun to kind of trace where these these footprints are going and imagine where you know the animal went up the tree or under a fence or wherever it might be underground in the case of bulls, um, and then yeah everyone's sort of you know focused moving moving one way. The uh, the creature on the bottom left hand corner it seems to be very different than the others and it almost is as though it's two footed and walking on snowshoes. So I'm wondering whether it's a human being of some sort. Great question. Yeah, and one of the things that I love about this piece is that I'm not entirely sure. I do, I agree with you that it certainly looks more human and I have been trying to figure out, yeah, whether these could be snowshoes, maybe one, you know, sort of abandoned at the side to get a closer look at these moose tracks. Um, but yeah, I think, yeah, certainly walking on, on two feet and maybe, I don't even know if it's human or maybe some kind of spirit or something. It's it certainly doesn't, you know, easily align with any any creature that I I know very precisely. I love this kind of these big lips that are sticking out too, and this long either horn or sort of tuft of hair going at the back. We're not quite sure because it's almost silhouetted. Yeah. Um, and but yeah. the inner the inner structure is different too. It does it's not the same as the the moose skeletons. Absolutely. Yeah, so that might, and Norval Morrison was really quite big on that. He he often thought it was boring how in, say, European art historical traditions, you only saw the exterior, right? If you were painting a portrait of a person or an animal, any living thing, he thought, well, that's pretty boring that you just see what they look like on the outside. Like, we've got all of these complicated spiritual, emotional things happening on the inside. And so that's part of why he developed this technique to be able to, to see inside later on in his career. This one's 1962, but later on in his career, he even came up with this neat sort of color map where he would show the inside and, and there'd be these little almost cells of different colors that would correlate in his mind with different emotions. And so I think you're on to something here. The fact that the interior is also different likely means that this is some kind of um, different, different being than, than the moose. Let's see what else we have here in the chat. We've got, uh, yeah, the inside and the outside. Yeah, lots of folks commenting on the movement. Yeah, and a kind of simplicity. Yeah, there's a starkness to this. On the one hand, there are elements that are a bit surreal and to me almost dreamlike. Um, again, we don't know if this is moose sort of throughout their own lifespan or if it's something kind of in the moment. 
Um, and then on the other, yeah, quite, quite um, simplistic in some ways. Uh, Marisi here is saying, yeah, one creature at the bottom left, yeah, oh, almost seems sad. Could you expand on that? What do you think, what do you think in this, the way that Morisot has depicted this figure um, uh, means sadness to you or makes you think that it might be sad? So Reese could respond or, or others as well, or you might disagree. You might think there's a different emotion going on here. Yeah, another saying, yeah, that they agree that it's kind of dreamlike, um, doesn't have to be logical, absolutely. Yeah, oh, others thinking maybe this could be a rabbit of some sort. A snowshoe hare? Is that actually a name of a type of thing, Barbara? Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. I guess their footprints look almost like snowshoes, or? <laughs> their feet are long, yeah. Very cool. Okay, maybe it could be a snowshoe hare. Um, yeah, sort of downcast, yeah. Um, I see, yeah, and Marisi is responding here. Yeah, maybe it's correlating with sadness because the head is down. Um, <laughs> yeah, bent over. Yeah, so lots, lots of really fascinating things going on here. And someone also in the chat had mentioned maybe trapping, right? If we're thinking of, of hunting moose or trapping, um, Morisot would have had experience doing that as a teenager. He did a lot of trapping, a lot of berry picking. Um, he was born on um, a reserve. So he was raised, he was born in 1939 and then raised as was tradition, raised by um, his maternal grandparents and had a, for you know many years, sort of a very uh, traditional indigenous way of life and way of learning um, up until he was uh, put in residential school. Again, being born in 1939, this is the era when you know, there were lots of residential schools um, and lots of outlawing of traditions and, and cultural practices. So in that case, had a very rough upbringing. He was in, I believe, was two different um, residential schools uh, and suffered quite a lot of abuse there. And then as a teenager, returned essentially to, to more traditional ways of life and um, would have known kind of intimately how to do some of these hunts. Oh, we've got a couple of questions here. So what does it say in the circle on the right hand side? I believe this is his signature. And depending, again, I don't read Cree or Ojibwe. Um, in, by 1962, I believe he had already married with a woman who was Cree. And so there was a brief period of time he was signing his name with Cree symbols. Um, and I think later on uh, did it with Ojibwe symbols as well. But I'm quite certain that this is his signature um, in either Cree or Ojibwe symbols. Um, and then does the figure see the moose or are they protected by the land? That's a really good question because there's not, you know, there's not tons of interaction going on here. And so we might wonder uh, what exactly is happening. I'm gonna see, oh yeah, that's gonna work. Um, there, so I'll give a little bit of background on this particular time period in Morisot's life as well. In the late fifties, he started slowly to be recognized as an artist. Ever since he was a young boy, a young boy, he was very sort of just drawn to art. He was always sketching things, very drawn to the petroglyphs um, and birch bark scrolls that he would find in and around his area. He'd be sort of walking, walking around and see these very ancient symbols of thunderbirds or other figures. Um, and so he was often very drawn to those. And then as a young man would want to recreate these. And he was also very interested in hearing stories that were offered by elders and sort of had the impulse to, to draw some of these out. His grandfather, his maternal grandfather, with whom um, you know he lived and he was raised by his maternal grandparents in large part, his maternal grandfather was a shaman um, and very involved in sort of Medewawin uh spirituality and so he had access to a lot of these very sacred stories and ceremonies but when he started putting some of this on paper a number of people in the community protested and they said you know that's not for sharing uh, these are our sacred stories and um they're not for the wider world and so he did have a bit of a 
a conflict there inside himself with this strong desire to share these stories that he was so passionate about. And then also, um, yeah, some community members feeling like that wasn't the best idea. Um, and as he, so he continued to make art and slowly but surely we were making, was making connections in the art world. And in 1962 had his first show at the Pollock Gallery in Toronto. So this was um, the year that he made this. So this particular year was quite important to him. And it was the first time that an indigenous, contemporary indigenous artist had had a show in Toronto, a solo show in Toronto. And all of the work sold very quickly. And it was really 1962 that started to catapult him um, to a certain level of fame. And in many cases also helped set the stage for other indigenous artists who were you know, coming to terms with their own styles and um, finding some inspiration in what Morisot was doing. And over time, he ended up being very involved in the Woodland School with other Indigenous folks like um, Daphne Ojig. So there are some kind of stylistic similarities too. And he did a number of paintings of moose. This was something that he was really drawn to, maybe again, going back to his knowledge of actually, you know, um, hunting them. But um, he also had this quote, he had heard this story from um, uh, another Ojibwe man who he greatly admired. And I'll, I, I had it, but I tried to paste it in here, but the chat isn't letting me actually paste it. Maybe while Lauren is leading her session, I'm gonna copy and try to repaste the quote, but I'll paraphrase it sort of badly here. Um, there was an Ojibwe man who had told a story about when he was a young boy, he felt that his spirit was inside of a moose for protection. And that the moose really, you know, took care of him and protected him from the outside world and he was quite shielded. And then started to emerge during his middle life. He kind of walked alongside the moose instead. Um, and his spirit became discharged from the body. And then in older life, he felt he didn't need that protection anymore and so was able to walk more independently. Um, and so the moose, you know, was not, didn't take on this protector role anymore. And so a number of works, and I'm not sure if that particular story inspired this painting, um, but he did relay that story on numerous occasions about other moose works of art. And this one, given that there are these sort of three um, different moose, maybe interpreted as being at different times in his life, could, uh, could potentially be a good fit. Um, Oh, and this is interesting. So Robin here is reading this figure here as maybe a submissive stance to be allowed to join the pack and be accepted. Ooh, I really like that interpretation. That's quite powerful. Yeah, maybe trying to learn from the moose or yeah, become part of it or yeah, I like that a lot. So a few things that, and again, this is relatively early on in Morisot's career. He had been making art for a long time, but really this was the time where he was coming into his style. And so a few things that folks have already noted um, is this kind of X-ray quality that we get the privilege of sort of seeing inside these creatures too. And then also in the Woodland School, many artists use these kind of thick black outlines. Uh, for their figures and then there's often some other kind of line that's connecting different people and different elements of the story so we could already see that at play here we write we have these thick black outlines and then we have this brown line that's almost connecting the moose but then also connecting this figure whether it's a snowshoe grab hair snowshoe hair I think or potentially a person or some kind of spiritual figure is also really interconnected here um, and that line, that interconnected line was thought to be something quite um, related to the spirit too, in the realm of the spirit. Interestingly, as Morisot became more and more famous and recognized on a more global stage, he was called by Marc Chagall, who also was sort of a dreamlike, spiritual, surrealist artist. Um, uh, he was called Picasso of the North by Chagall. Uh, I'm not sure if Morisot liked that term, I don't see tons of relationships between him and Picasso, uh, but certainly did, you know, make a name for himself on, on the world stage. And I'm wondering, Lauren, you had mentioned that, um, you know, when you looked at this, it made you think of Matisse in some ways too. Did you want to say a few words about that and maybe what we're going to get inspired by here for our own art? Sure. So one of the things that I really like about Matisse's work later on in life, he was not able to see. So he was using scissors 
and cutting out shapes. And he actually did quite a few beautiful collages that were based on organic forms, uh, coral and shells and, and uh, plant life. And so for me, the, the horns in this uh, really remind me of Matisse's late, late work, uh, you know, sort of when he, when he was almost completely blind. And so that notion of letting your scissors create a man, um, meandering mark is kind of one of the things I think we're going to investigate a little bit in terms of elk or moose, you know, horns. But uh, yeah, I love that. And that and going back to what folks were saying too about that sense of movement, right? We don't have these impressionist brush strokes here that that you know are typical ways maybe that we'd imagine movement being communicated. But there really is, even though you know the figures are pretty static, there really is a, a kind of sense of forward momentum or movement happening in this piece, which is neat that you can imagine doing that with scissors. I'm excited Absolutely. to try. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful piece. And I do love the meandering line, which would be very easy to convey. Uh, any of this would be quite easy to convey just through cutting out and gluing down because it's very, his work is very flat in terms of how we paint, how we paint it, right? With the exception of some aspects, but this is a very, very flat painting. Mm -hmm. All right, and so for the sake of time, let's take a look at our at our next piece here. This is a fun one. Some folks might be familiar with Cornelius Kragoff, others not at all. And I know it's a little bit small because we've got the frame in here too. <laughs> so you might have to squint your eyes a little bit in order to see what's going on. Uh, but I'm curious, I'll start with the same question. So what do you see happening here? What's going on in this in this image? Very different style, obviously. And a little earlier, we're here in, you know, 100 years earlier, essentially. What do you see? I'll give you a clue that um, Cornelius Kragoff was often trying to inject a bit of a sense of humor into, into some of his genre scenes here. Oh yeah, Kimberly, Kimberly saying that, yeah, wouldn't know what was happening except the, the title gives it away. Yeah, he does have quite a lot of pretty uh, <laughs> obvious titles that spell things out. So Bilking the Toll Gate is the name ah. of the title here. Ah. What, did I hear a voice there? <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty funny one. So yeah, kind of joyous, lots of snow, lots of energy and movement. Barbara saying, yeah, there seems to be a lot of disruption, uproar, good words. Yeah, I didn't even know that Canada had toll gates. Yeah, we're going way back in time here, <laughs> essentially. This is um, Cornelius Kriegoff was from Holland and he ended up um, marrying a woman from who lived near Quebec City. And so he moved there. And so when he came to Canada, he really had a bit of, I mean, the advantage and maybe the difficulties associated with being a bit of an outsider. And he created a lot, a lot of paintings. And if we look carefully at this, we'll see, you know, it's quite easy to see how he was trained in the Dutch tradition. And of course, you know, there was Dutch genre painting, which really means, you know, outdoor sort of everyday people scenes. Um, we have a lot of those in our AGO collection as well, too. People on skating rinks and just sort of, you know, dressed up in fancy wools and uh, winter attire. And you just get a little glimpse into everyday life before photography took off. Um, and so he brought that tradition with him to Canada, but then he had a very different subject, of course. He was painting rural Quebecois. Oh yeah, and Kimberly saying, I like the red habitant hat. This is, we, we actually have quite a few. We have quite a lot of paintings by Cornelius Kriegoff in our collection. And a lot of them, this is kind of one of those token <laughs> things that are in almost every picture, I think, of his genre scene paintings, these like exterior winter ones. Um, there's often someone, an habitant in this red hat. Uh, so yeah, habitant, not only hockey team, but kind of means rural Quebecois folks. And so as an outsider, he got a real kick out of these people. And oftentimes when he painted them, it wasn't in the most flattering light. Um, so in this particular case, you can see we have, yeah, probably a father and son duo here. And they, this is my reading, but they likely live here in this little house, which also serves as a toll booth, essentially. And so anyone who's coming by on their, their 
horse and sleigh are supposed to pay a couple of cents. Um, and these guys clearly didn't want to. This one, it's a little hard to see, but he's got a bottle in his hand. So, you know, they might be mildly inebriated and uh, trying to have a good time. And he painted a, a bunch of these that are very similar. Um, in some cases, you know, they're in a sleigh and the sleigh is falling over. And there's always something a little bit humorous going on in, in Craig Off depiction of Les Habitants. Um, uh, oh, good. And so Fleur Ange is giving us some good background on the word. So Habitant is someone who owned land from the 17th century in New France. Thanks, Fleur Ange. Um, yeah, and he's thumbing his nose at the toll keeper, which is quite rude. Yeah. And so, you know, local people, les, les, les habitants who were living there, um, had mixed reactions to Kragoff's kind of interpretation of them and their way of life. But Cornelius Kragoff was actually our country's first commercially successful painter. And part of the reason for this was because at, during this time period, sort of mid 19th century, there were a lot of European soldiers garrisoned in and around the area. And of course, this was before the internet, social media, before photography could have, you know, really existed in, in a widespread capacity. And um, so a lot of these folks wanted to send something back to their families in Europe to show them what their new life was like over here in Quebec. And so Kragoff sort of stepped in. He saw a commercial uh, possibility here. And so he painted paintings. And again, they're kind of stereotypical. Yes, and a lot of these frames are original. These come to us from the Ken Thompson collection. And yeah, most of them, I think that's why we've included the frame here on this particular uh, slideshow too, is because uh, the vast majority are the original frames. Um, and so, yeah, so he would, you know, paint these paintings and uh, people would buy them and send them back overseas to their family and say, look at all this snow. Can you believe it? This is what these wild people are like. Laurent just saying, yeah, what do French Canadians think of how they were represented as being drunks? Yeah, and there's often, you know, a lot of his titles are sort of the, the morning after merrymaking, and we'll see all of these people outside of a big house kind of still drunk and like falling off of a banister and um, certainly a bit problematic, but he did find a market. Yeah, as Kimberly is saying, Exactly, yeah, so he found a market. So let's say someone liked this one. They said, oh, that's so funny. I'm gonna send it back to my family overseas. Someone else would see this and say, oh, I want one just like it. I, I love that tool story, how they're just breaking through the gate. So he would do like a series of paintings that were almost identical. In our collection, it's really lovely because we've paired them side by side. And so um, you can see there's always slight differences in the background or maybe the clothes that people are wearing. Um, but a lot of them are very, very similar. And so he could churn them out quite quickly. He had a kind of like a blueprint, right? He had kind of templates that people could choose from. And so that's why he was able to, to make his living as an artist. Um, yeah, and I, in some ways, you know, quite problematic the way that he was representing folks, especially as an outsider. Um, he also, as part of our collection, we also have a number of pictures that he did, a uh, number of paintings he did of Indigenous people, sometimes portraits that folks may or may not have agreed to, um, or we're not sure under what circumstances. But in other cases, really from a distance. Um, from accounts that we have, he was quite fascinated by Indigenous ways of life, um, and certainly, you know, would often see people engaged in hunting or sort of having a a uh, fire and he would, you know, want to paint what he saw. So he did a whole series of indigenous people as well. But they don't read very well from our contemporary perspective. Um, again, they are really at a distance in many cases, romanticizing indigenous ways of life. There's little evidence that he actually got to know indigenous people. And so um, in many cases, these depictions are, are rather simplified. So it is a fascinating, um, piece of our country's history and, and it's nicely curated in our Canadian galleries because we have, you know, these maybe more controversial depictions of Abiton and Indigenous folks. And then on the other hand, we have a lot of works by Indigenous artists, you know, showing their own perspectives on these things and um, their own voice where they're more con in control of their image and the stories they're telling. So certainly, you know, fascinating part of our, our country's history and the complexities of the story are very much on display in our in our gallery space. So I'm going to hand it over to Lauren R. Now I'll stop sharing my screen.
art making yeah okay so what i'm hoping that you have is potentially paper and scissors and glue and if you are making cards it'd be a good idea to have an envelope to help figure out what size the card needs to be so is it square is it rectangular is it oblong is it a whole big massive envelope um and you know potentially depending on how complicated you want to be you could use that thing that looks like a little tiny knife that's actually called a stencil cutter and there's a small healing board underneath it but you can by and large i think scissors are the easier method um, and depending on what kind of card you're making if it's a holiday card that is kind of uh, festive related to christmas by all means you can use things like wrapping paper but it could just be a card for sending and catching catching up with people um it could be for any particular any particular notion for me i really like writing a end of year holiday card to people that kind of reach out to them um especially in general but now winter is always one of those times of reflection can we get the next slide okay so here's just a couple of examples of cards and one of the things i really like to do is i like to do something to the envelope because i'm thinking these these mail carriers get so bored with seeing bills and you know blank envelopes so i kind of like making it a little bit more interesting on the outside and personalizing it to go with the inside of the card uh, and i was using on the left hand side there i was using that clear um acetate stuff that sometimes you use to decorate uh to decorate flowers and stuff but they're it's not really great to glue on so i'm not going to demonstrate with that but that is another thing to do to create that multiple layered look on the left hand side there uh and next slide okay and then the notion of does the card have to be and i'll demonstrate this one does it have to just be on the front can it be a folded up card where you have information or pictures on the outside and then you have pick more pictures on the inside? So this is all the same card. It's just that there's more stuff going on as you open it up to go with a regular, I think it's number 10 envelope. Okay, I think that might be it. All right, so basically what I'm interested in doing is, is I while we were while we were looking at that really great sort of PowerPoint with the Norval Morisot piece, I decided that I needed to add innies inside my mooses from previous niece, from previous card, the previous card. And so then the other thing I added was, I don't know about your neighborhood, but my neighborhood is festooned with hearts in people's houses. So I thought I'd add that. And then I added the heart in here, which is not showing up very well because it's the same value as this other color. But um, so this card has has a couple of elements to it. It has a front piece to the envelope. It has a back piece that's all about love because we need more of that. And then and then the fact that there is some space in here to do some writing. So this is kind of most people have this sort of size envelope. And so using an eight and a half piece of paper, you can kind of fold it up and do interesting things to it. And so that's one strategy. Uh, and I do have a lot of that kind of envelope. So um, I also have sort of a bigger envelope. So with this one, there's like layers of this uh, green film, right? And just putting on a, a you know, snowflakes or something I can, I can do forever because they're so much fun. So what I have going on here is I've kind of chosen some envelopes that are just a little bit smaller. And I've kind of already cut paper that sort of fits them. And so I would say the first step is you really have to work from the envelope out. Because if you make a really great card and then it doesn't fit into anything, that's just so unfortunate. So, and I really liked the uh, Craig off piece with the frames. I thought, oh yeah, what if I actually cut the edges to kind of mimic what was going off in, in his piece? So that's something to kind of consider is, it could just be you having a good time cutting with scissors. Uh, what I did do, I don't know if it's going to show up. No, it's going to look like I'm just magically capable, but I did draw, or you can sort of see it if I hold it like that. I drew a moose type shape, and this is going to be the back of it. So whatever drawing you're doing, 
this is going to be the side I'm going to glue face up so that you can't see that I'm not capable of just randomly cutting step out. And so for me, the thing with scissors is it's not about the hand that's cutting. It's about the hand that's holding the paper that is the is the important player in this. So because if I'm constantly moving this hand, I'm not getting a lot of pivot. And so the paper handing paper holding hand is the hand that I think is the better is takes a, a more leading role than just the person the part that's using the scissors. So I've kind of created a moose shape. You can draw any animal or any creature that you want. I kind of like animals just because they're one of those things that we don't get to see enough unless we're sitting very quietly and we have uh, we have a backyard or something for them to visit. Uh, and so I, I like animals don't hopefully don't offend anybody. Um, you never know what kind of card you're going to make and you want to make sure that you're making something that someone will appreciate. And I'm thinking of a friend who is uh, who really loves animals and really loves he loves moose particular, but he has COVID. So I'm knowing that this card is going to be for him. And so you can see that I'm really using the paper hand to, to move things as opposed to the hand that is holding the scissors. And, you know, you can be kind of fancy with it. I mean, this is one of the things I really liked about Norval Morisot's work and, uh, and Matisse's work was the notion of layering on top of each other. So if you sort of think of it like a wedding cake where you have, um, you know, a big piece of paper, and then you're putting, you know, smaller and smaller layers on top. That's kind of what works with, with Morisot's pieces, right? Is he's thinking, here's a creature, and then there's a space inside it, and some information in that. And then inside that space, there's another space. So uh, the strategy I'm going to use is thinking about sort of bigger shapes, and then putting littler shapes on top of that. And, uh, and I'm hoping that people have, you know, scissors and uh, paper to work with, but okay. So I basically got, and the thing that's really great that, that Matisse was very much into is not only did he cut things out of paper, but he used the negative space as well for his depictions. So nothing went to waste. And I think that's another thing I really like about Morisot's work is that he's all about packing a lot of information into a tiny space. So the negative spaces, which is the green in this case, was just as important as the object itself. So now I've got this really cool negative, uh, negative space pink that's not the animal, but it's this other shape. And I'm thinking I'd like to put some of it into the picture as well. So I'm going to kind of cut around this. And I mean, it's kind of obvious that it's coming from the moose at this point. So I might adjust it a little bit so that it's not quite so obvious that it's moose. It's a moose thing. So I might move that. And I really love the way that he was also looking at um, that connection of line. So is it gonna be a tall picture or is it gonna be a wide picture is something to think about uh, in terms of where it's gonna go in uh, composition. And in terms of collaging, I tend to not glue things down right away because I, you know, what if I like, oh, I really know I like this, but I don't know where to put it or what I'm gonna do with it. And so I kind of create a bunch of objects and then I turn around and say, okay, here are my objects. Now I'm gonna try and do something with them. Um, and so that's something to kind of consider is figure out what would be the best situation compositionally. Okay. And, you know, maybe some things will be better than others. And it's not that it needs to be super full with lots and lots of stuff. And it doesn't necessarily need to make sense. Like this might become a tree, which I think half a tree maybe. And so then I can kind of eliminate some of it. And now all of a sudden it's like a moose in a space 
and maybe the moose is standing on or near something and that there's a tree nearby. So that notion of negative space is basically looking at what's going on in behind the object and how can, how can it be activated with, with the objects that you're putting on top. And so if things are really close together, then you're creating all these little tiny holes or you can kind of say, you know what, I actually want to create a pathway and maybe there is, you know, a little bit more solidity in there or a really nice little negative space in between. And so, I mean, I'm not sure, uh, and maybe Lauren can answer this in terms of when Norval, Norval Morso's process, when he was painting, did he just fill the page up with a whole bunch of objects and then try and put in other things? Or did he actually have a plan that he drew out in a sketchbook and then kind of, you know, had it all really set up? You know, that's something that I would be curious about, if you know. Yeah, that. good question about the sketchbook. I'm not sure. Um, I've, I've not seen, you know, pages from his sketchbooks. I don't know how much he used one, but I think to answer your question, it was very rarely completely spontaneous. I think he... He would have a bit of a vision in his mind and would deliberately connect different elements to others. And one of the um, one of the kind of characteristics of woodland school art, too, is that there's often a lot going on with like the central figures. But there's often a kind of how do you say it, like a kind of in, indistinguishable background, sort of. Right. Um, and so it wouldn't necessarily be yeah that the whole space was you know, filled up. I, I really like what you were saying about negative space there, that in some cases that was very powerful too, that there's actually no, you know, visible background. It might just be a bright color for a particular reason. Um, but that, yeah, these these figures would be against against that and then intertwined amongst each other. That's right. Like a sol some sort of a solid background. And he was totally known for that. I mean, the Thunderbird uh, transformation of the Thunderbird we have at the AGO, this sort of color was the background, bright, bright, bright orange. And then there would be objects in place, in place around it. So the thing that's nice about colored paper is that you've already got, you've already got sort of one element uh, taken care of in terms of color. And, uh, you know, and you can introduce lots of colors or you can be pretty minimal. I love the fact that he had, you know, tiny little footprints and tiny little trees. And so, uh, and it didn't necessarily, there wasn't necessarily an overlap of something hiding in behind. It would, you would see, you know, pretty much the whole creature or character in his work. So they were really carefully placed, I felt. Um, and so that's the other thing that's nice about collage is, yes, I could have, uh, I could have something in behind something else and say, yep, I want to do that. But then it could also be that it's that it's all all connected in one way. So I think I'm going to make the tree have bare bones inside it and then have a bigger shape on the outside of it. And it's amazing, Lauren, just when I see you do that, right? Like when you had that tree just against that more yellow background and now added the green, like emotionally that changes quite a bit, right? Like these, yeah. these, yeah, sure. yeah, these, these colors are powerful and they they kind of yeah speak to us emotionally <laughs> psychologically yeah, well I'm kind of I mean the pop art the pop art aspect of Morso's work was one of the things I really liked is he was he was a master color theorist I mean one of the things that he did a lot of is what's called the bezelt effect which is taking taking two colors in this case I'm going to say green and pink and he would create a pattern that would repeat almost like fingers uh intertwining within the shapes inside his characters or creatures and they would be very similar in value being um maybe color opposites but very uh very similar in value in terms of this green is reading as a darker green than this value of this lighter green right so it's vibrating maybe a little bit more here than it would be on this green which is a little bit darker than it and so what would happen is when you're looking at his work, sometimes it's actually 
uh, going in and out of focus because your eyes are trying to say, well, what's more important? Is this the color that's forward or is this the green color that's forward? And it's really wonderful to see with his with his brown shapes and his objects um, and how that does kind of become an optical illusion. And it's because he's using really, really bright colors, um, but he's also mixing colors to really make them work. So that's another element that I really like about his pieces is he he definitely picks his colors quite carefully. He's not just randomly choosing tubes of paint. He's definitely mixing his browns um, and uh, not just using it right out of the tube. So the disadvantage with collage is you're limited to whatever color your paper is. If you want to paint your paper any color and wait for it to dry and cut it out, that's what Matisse did, was he actually turned around and said, well, I want to make certain colors. It was maybe construction paper didn't exist. I don't know. But he would he would make his own his own colors uh, of paint and and then paint the page and then cut the paper out. So there's some interesting playback with that. And if I switch out. You know, this mousse on on red, it's got a different personality. Then if I switched it out onto say a blue background, you know, it's got a different personality again. So I haven't committed to any one of these colors. I was thinking these two colors are color complements, and so they might be really jazzy, but maybe it's like, I mean, he is sick with, you know, sort of a fluey type feeling. So maybe I don't want to make him so nauseous that he can't look at the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so thinking about that is an aspect too. And, you know, so that's why red and green go really nicely together because they are color complements, but they're also equal in value. So uh, orange and blue are color complements, but orange is a much lighter color than blue, and so it has a very different read to it. Uh, and yellow and purple are color complements. I don't have any yellow and purple, so I can't demonstrate that, but that's something to kind of think about. So, you know, for me, this, this is really vibrating a lot, and it's being quite trippy, whereas this is a little bit calmer, still kind of nifty, but not quite so over-the-top design-wise. That's something to consider when you're when you're making these kinds of kinds of decisions uh, in terms of what colors you want to create. And you know, the great thing is is that we're creating our own little world with these objects, and we can decide what the story is and what the narrative is. And uh, and so anything goes. The other thing is, if you really like a shape, you can just go ahead and then trace that shape onto something else if you think you can't recreate it. Uh, I'm using sort of a cardstock just from Staples that's a little bit heavier. It's sort of a not a 20 pound paper, but closer to a 48 or 50 pound paper. And so it's much easier to trace out. So if I wanted to make this shape again, I, there's no way I could make it exactly, but I could at least trace it out and then uh, wind up with another tree shape maybe living on the other side of this moose. So that's kind of what I'm gonna do now. So, you know, in terms of collage, making lots of different shapes, keeping the negative and the positive aspect of it, negative being the, the Audi of the thing that you're cutting out. So the moose and then the moose's uh, negative space around it, both of those can be quite, quite nifty in terms of, uh, Put, being put into your image and then don't glue it down until you've kind of really figured out what you think you want the composition to do whether that's things overlapping or things that are uh, you know in terms of where your eye is going to travel with the background color or the foreground color and uh, kind of playing around with that so that's another aspect that's kind of important. And I wonder too, hearing hearing Lauren talk about this, if anyone wants to share in the chat or just unmute yourself and let us know, you know, some decisions maybe you're making about color combinations or things you're you're struggling with trying to figure out what goes where. If you're making yeah. a two or you've opted for another kind of theme here. For sure. I appreciate that. Thank you for pointing that out. Let's hear what are is anybody making or is everybody just watching? <laughs> Here, uh, is fine. <laughs> yes, Barbara. I, 
So I actually, um, I look out my window, I'm four hours earlier. It's completely black and there's a ton of snow. And so I started out thinking that I would do something where I'd reverse the color. I'd have black in the background and white trees. But then I realized you can't write on the black background. So I'm right. now switching that to my envelope. Right. And then I'm going to reverse having a white background with the black trees on the other one. It's, I'm trying to figure out how to do this, but but it is exciting to. Reverse. So one of the things that you can do is a friend of mine makes cards in watercolor all the time and she always uses dark paper. And then she found what's called a gel pen and gel pens come in white. And so you could potentially do all of your writing on the inside in white or what you could do is you have your card on black and your lovely white trees, and then you could put inside the card a white piece of paper and write in it. So I think you should, I think you should stick with the black background, see what happens with that. You know, I think and I, love, I love that it came from your experience, right? Like waking up in the pitch darkness. What is it like in Alaska now? How much, how many hours of daylight do you have at this time of year? Oh, we're like at five hours. And it's not really daylight. It's kind of like twilight. Wow. And I'm looking right out at a window and it's just black, but I can see the snow. And we had a big dump of snow. So there's about, about three feet of snow up against the window. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> a winter wonderland for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I really like about Norval Morisot's work, and we're running out of time, but I wanted to mention it, is his notion of literal layering within his uh, within his objects. So sometimes, if you do make it ever to the AGO and see the the um, transformation of the Thunderbird, he's physically actually putting paint on top of other paint. So it almost looks like it's a wedding cake. And the paint gets thicker and thicker and thicker as he goes. And he's kind of sometimes got really big blobs of orange and yellow on top of things. And so that's one of the reasons why when I saw this piece in our collection, I went, oh, this is so much like a collage because we're just sticking things on top of other things, on top of other things, on top of other things. And, uh, and so that notion of what's going on inside the creature is, is just as important, whether that's their mind or their stomach, or their, or their soul, um, for sure. Why not? What's going on inside people's heads? You know, we want to know, and I would love to know what's going on inside people's heads. And uh, and so that notion of putting in part of a story inside that, saying, hey, you know, I'm sending you love, or I'm sending you, sending me well wishes, um, is something to consider for sure. Um, Absolutely. All right. And Lauren, are you actually, are you making any art or are you just enjoying the conversation? <laughs> I started, I started by making, but then I just kind of started meditating on what you're, what you're creating here. That's so. fair. That's fair. Absolutely. We, uh, sometimes it's nice to just absorb what other people are doing. Uh, I, for me, the reason why I love collage with scissors is I love seeing what will happen with the journey with what the scissors are doing, you know, in terms of the mark making just with what, what scissors do and uh, thinking about the negative and the positive shapes and what happens with that. Um, for me, I really like the notion of sort of the Aurora Borealis. I guess I bet Barbara might actually get to have some of that being so far north with the solar flares and seeing if there's any of that going on. Um, that's something to kind of think about too, is what kinds of magic we can create just with, with the objects that we have. Um, and we have so a few, then, yeah. A few questions and comments in the chat here. So Marilyn's saying she makes her own Christmas cards every year, and this is giving her inspiration, which is great. Right. And then Myrna is asking, what is the best type of glue to use so that it doesn't show through when there's lots of layering? 
That is a really good question. So now I'm going to say that this is Elmer's, uh, this is Elmer's washable glue stick. I do prefer the YooHoo glue over this. Um, this has, this has a bit of color that does once it's dry, it does kind of disappear, but the trick with the gluing is, I mean, I don't want to come in, but I'm going to glue just for the sake of showing you're not putting the glue like all over the under page and then sticking it down. That is, that is the biggest mistake ever with collaging. What you want to do is you want to have potentially an area and I'm going to, this is the thing I use is just a board. And I have, I put the glue on the object that is going to be glued down and I'm pretty vigorous with it attaching it to, you know, all edges because you don't want to have parts peeling up. That's kind of annoying. And then it's a question of sticking it down. And for myself, what I'll sometimes do is I'll actually put another piece on top of it and I'll really, really rub it so that I'm getting it nice and flat because it's hard to do that when it's lots of little pieces. You don't want to tick up one of any of the edges, right? So really, really pushing it down. Okay, it's really pushed down. It won't, it won't come off. Uh, and then that way it really has a good adhesion to it. And so it's, uh, you can use, you know, the white glue with a glue stick glue. The trick with that, um, and of course, I tried to find some this morning that were that was actually not totally solid and it was not a successful adventure. Um, but the trick is, even with the white glue, you want to have like a stick or a pencil and you're rubbing it on and you're putting all the excess off, not on not on the page that you're working on, but on the page that it, that you're doing the glue application. And then that way you don't have any excess, you don't have any excess on this page, right? And then it's just a question of rubbing again. If there's the ooze factor, which certainly does happen with the white glue, um, I sometimes have a Q-tip and I'll kind of clean up around it just so that it's not so obvious that there's big gobs of glue everywhere. But don't put the glue on the page that is the surf substrate, put it on the object that you're cutting out and then stick it down and then really rub it. Lauren, I'm wondering, we just have about two minutes left. Should we see if anyone out there wants to hold up what they've been working on? That is a great idea. And uh, so for anybody who does have things, maybe put yourself in gallery view. And that's what I'm going to do too, to see what we have. Oh, Barbara, let's see. Oh, wow. Love it. Oh, yeah. Oh, Look at all the little tendrils for sure. Oh, it looks both tree-like and so, human somehow, like reaching up. So this is actually the envelope. Nice. And then, and then the reverse is going inside the envelope. Great. Beautiful idea. And I love the fact that you used really, really thin bits too. So like there's no garbage in collage, right? It's all used. <laughs> that's exactly what happened is the bits <laughs> left over. I just kept shaving them. Nice. Well done. Anybody else want to share? We've got... Oh, Margaret here. Margaret. Oh, nice. Um, so what I tried to do was uh, create a bit of a interesting winter sky with a low sun and a bit of some silhouettes on the snow. I love it. This is great. It, it, is a, it is a card. I just have to glue it on with an envelope. So I'll have to do something to the envelope as well, I think. What yeah. materials did you use there? I'm trying to figure it out. Um, this is just some sketch paper I folded in half and some paper. And then I just, I had some uh, old origami paper that looks like this. Nice. So I tried to cut it so the snow was at the top. So it looks like the trees have snow on the top. Nice. Um, and same with the sun. I took a piece of the origami paper and I cut it out so that it yeah. kind of the the color sort of changes yeah oh, yeah the really gradient that with your haze now gorgeous and and the the background stuff was just I don't know some colored paper that I had from a dollar store or something this stuff here so it's already pre-printed like that neat Super. yeah I love I love the fact that you put the gradient in that really makes it uh quite quite marvelous yeah 
And I think we're at time, but Florence, did you have one that you wanted to share too? Well, Zola? I haven't I haven't glued anything. So oh, I, neat. And it's just wrapping paper, so it's not flat. Right. But what I did was I folded the paper and got two. Uh, I like that idea of tracing the moose on the back. And then the two were close together. And it, uh, it looked a bit like a really neat tree. Uh, cool. Like conserving the negative, like it, it's sort of becoming another, I like it, the two antlers, like from the top and the bottom. Yeah. So, neat shapes, very yeah. neat shapes. Those are keepers for sure. <laughs> and I think Ola was holding one up too. Did we miss you, Ola? Yeah, just hang on a second and I'll try and pick it up again. I love how different all of these are too. Like the, you know, the instructions. So I actually, um, let's see. Is that felt? So I yeah because i didn't have paper around the house so oh I that's love uh let's see if i can yeah so again oh. i just used a lot of the negative shapes of the green to make more branches and fit oh, it around with it and like kind of x-ray style is that a little squirrel or something in, in the <laughs> that's a little well yeah i think it's going to be a little squirrel and who knows what else will go inside there Oh, that is so yeah. fun. I love the shapes of the tree, uh, the tree branches. Those are lovely. Very, very Canadian-esque. Yeah. <laughs> Hemlock. Yes. For well, sure. Well, thank you, everybody. I feel very inspired. And, and I was already trying to embrace winter, but you folks have helped me embrace it even further. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Thanks to my, my fellow Lauren for such a brilliant art activity and all those bright colors that you brought to our day. Yeah. Um, we will be continuing to run Senior Social into the new year. So our colleague here behind the scenes has just put a link in the chat. Um, uh, so pretty soon you'll see what the winter sessions are that we have in store for you. So a number of more virtual ones like this, and then there's gonna be one more um, in person in the new year too. So feel free to keep checking the website for those. And yes, we hope to see all of you back again very soon. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and enjoying the day. And if you do make anything, by all means, put it on Instagram with hashtag AGO makes or AGO Toronto, and then it'll get posted on our website. Uh, and so people can see all kinds of wonderful things made by, made by people who, who show up. So thank you for showing up. That's great. Thanks, everybody. Have a Thank great you. day. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>